I think we'll get started. Okay, I think we'll get started. I'd like to welcome everybody to our services this morning and a special welcome to those who may be listening online. And for those that may be listening online, they don't have a bulletin. Uh, participating in worship services this morning is myself, your chairman, Scott Kennedy. Um, doing the Lord's Table for us today will be Bernard Hartung. Our song leader is Barry Mellish. And um, bringing the message to us this morning is our preacher, Brian Thompson. And I'm going to ask if you will please stand as we open with hymn number 648. That's hymn number 648. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he Stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. For to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. He that our men now serve him against the number.
going to ask if you bow with me as we open with a word of prayer. Dear loving Father, most holy and awesome God, once again we want to thank you for this opportunity we have to come here this day, to be able to come here, dear Lord, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, whom we dearly love, to be able to come before your most holy presence, to be able to give you praise, glory, and honor. But most of all, dear Lord, we can sing praises to you, we can hear a message from your word, and we know that hearing your word, our faith will be strengthened. And we're just truly thankful for that. Lord, we are, we are very thankful for Brian and the messages that he brings to us, that he brings them to us in such a way that we can understand them. And dear Lord, we just pray that we take these messages, we hold them in our hearts, and dear Lord, when we leave this place, we can take it from our heart and share it with somebody else so that they too can come to know you as we do. And Lord, we just pray that you will give us that strength and that wisdom and that ability to do that. Because we do pray, dear Lord, that every life we meet and every life that we touch, they can see you living in us so that they too can come to know you. Lord, once again, we ask at this time also that you ask, we ask that you be with our children. We ask that you watch over them, guide, guard, direct them, keep them safe, dear Lord. We just pray that they will continue to grow strong in your word and always look to you for guidance in their lives. Once again, dear Lord, we just ask also at this time that you forgive us for the things that we have done wrong. Dear Lord, we know that we do sin, but if we ask for that forgiveness, we know that we can receive it. And dear Lord, once again, we also ask at this time that you be with those, those that are not well. We know, dear Lord, that there are some that are grieving the loss of loved ones, that are hurting physically and spiritually. We just pray that you can be with each and every one of those situations and, and give the healing that they need so that they too can once, once again return here and worship with you. Lord, we just pray this from our hearts to yours. And we pray it all through your loving Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. To help prepare our minds for the Lord's table, we're going to sing hymn number 286. That's hymn number 286. And I'll ask if you stand again, please, as we sing. Wonderful story of love, tell it to me again. Wonderful story of love, wake the immortal. Angels with rapture announce it, shepherds with wonder receive it, sinner, oh, won't you believe it? Wonderful story of love. Bernard to bring his thoughts around the Lord's table.
Hope everybody has had a chance to pick up their emblems. Let's meet around the table this morning. I'm going to read a few verses from 1 John. 1 John chapter 5, starting at verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are in agreement. We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater, because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his Son. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Here the writer is reminding us that if we believe, we are sons of God. We need to love each other if we say we love God. And to love God is to obey His commands. And His commands are not burdensome. They are able, we are able to carry them out. And how we, it's through God and through our love in God that we have overcome the world. And how do we overcome that? By our faith in God. We must believe in Jesus because he is the Son of God. And we have the three that testify. The water, the blood, the spirit. And the spirit is the truth. Through Jesus, we have eternal life. And we can know and be assured that we have this eternal life through him if we continue to believe and continue to love him and do as he's asked us. So each first day of the week we meet around this table to remind us that Jesus went to the cross on our behalf because he knew we couldn't pay the price for our own salvation. He loved us that much that he was willing to give up his life in order for us to have eternal life. So each first day of the week we partake of these emblems, the bread, to remind us of his body that went to the cross. The fruit of the vine to remind us that his blood was shed for us. This time we're going to offer a blessing for the bread. Our loving Heavenly Father, we ask you now to bless this bread as it represents your son's body. Father, we're so thankful that you loved us so much that you sent your son, that your son loved us so much that he went to the cross on our behalf. Father, we ask now as we partake of this bread that we can be mindful of that great sacrifice, but also that great love that was shown for us. And Father, help us to have that same love in our lives for one another. And it's through your Son's name we pray. Amen. for a blessing for the cup. Loving Heavenly Father, we ask you now to bless this cup as it represents your son's blood. 
the blood that was shed on the cross to wash away our sins, to wipe that slate clean, to make them as if they've never happened. And Father, we're so thankful for this. And we ask that as we live our daily lives that we can be mindful of that great sacrifice and what it costs for us to have this hope and assurance. Father, we ask that as we go about our daily tasks that we can be mindful of this. And Father, help us to think of you as we make decisions and we enter into situations that we can make the right choices and always want to follow that example of your son as he showed us how it is that he wants us to live. And it's through his name we pray. Amen. Bernard. Today's scripture reading is taken from Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to the end of the chapter, and I'll be reading from the NIV. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's plate. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm, has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let them warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of birth. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone raises from the dead. And we'll turn the rest of the time over to Brian. Thank you for that introduction. <laughs> A little staticky, eh? <laughs> Not sure what that is. time I put it in my pocket. We'll just do that. <laughs> okay. It's good to see everybody. We have a lot of people here. We have lots of kids. Makes an old man like me feel a little younger today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Not only that, but have you noticed the spring in the air? Yeah, one of our older members said, I just feel like spring. <laughs> I won't let you know that Al said that. But <laughs> yeah, and I got spring in my legs and a lot more birds are singing and it's getting on to the middle of March, so I'm getting a lot more and more excited. 
Anyways, for those who are watching online, we always enjoy you taking the time to to join with us. It's a great uh, blessing to be able to have our services live streamed, and you can watch it from where from home. Sometimes you're not maybe feeling so well, and you can do it that way, or at other times you just uh, may be visiting and checking us out. So we're we're glad that you've done that, and and hope you'll continue to do that. And others have decided to come be with us again, and we really really appreciate your company. Hate to center you out, but it really gives us all a boost when you have decided to be with us. Your presence is certainly an encouragement to us. Okay, so what I'm going to show today, uh, I'm just going to give the credits right off the bat. Uh, are some? Uh, I'm not showing all of these images, but there are some Im- images here pertaining to our lesson that are free to use, but I'm certainly going to attribute uh, their usage to... Uh, Good News Productions International and College Press Publishing. We're talking about the rich man and Lazarus. And I believe it's referred to as a parable. I know there's all sorts of discussion as as to whether it's a true parable or just a parable. Of course, the parable is a story, right? And, uh, and of course, sometimes there's just made-up stories. And other times there are stories that are truthful and factual. What's unique about the passage in Luke 16 is that there are names that are used. And there are events that are used. And Jesus is the one that's narrating. And he's the one that's talking. And um, it's very hard to, to, to look at this particular parable and not think that it's talking about a true story. Uh, you'd have to look at it and say, okay, if it's not true, what is the point of it? And what is Jesus trying to say? Uh, and it's a passage of Scripture that for the Christians, you know, I don't know if Bernie knew this, but his lesson really around the Lord's table went really well with this. It's, uh, it's, it's a passage of Scripture to give confidence to the ones who read it or hear it. Um, you know, death is something that the Bible says will come to all of us. And it's nice to be able to leave this life with confidence, not in our own efforts, but in the efforts of Jesus and, and what he says to us and how that we can know that through him and through God's blessings and grace, we can uh, have a home prepared for us in heaven. It's all because of the Lord that we can get to go to heaven. But at the same time, we just don't sit back and do nothing and just live our life the way that we want to. So this is a good passage of scripture that will help us with that. Are you ready? Got some pictures for the young ones too, so they'll they'll be studying this real good. Maybe you can tell your parents when you get home what the lesson's all about. There was a certain rich man. How many of you want to be rich? It's okay. It's not wrong to be rich. How many of you want to have your riches have you? <laughs> There's a difference, eh? The Bible talks about people that were good and godly people, and they were rich. Job was one, Abraham was one, and Joseph of Arimathea was one, and they were very, very godly men. So to be rich doesn't mean that you're a bad person, because you can do great goodness, great good things with your uh, with your riches. Anyways, Jesus focuses in on two people, a certain rich man. And please don't take from this passage that if you eat chicken... <clears throat> Or drumsticks like this guy does, that uh, you're a bad person. <laughs> but anyways, the, it, it depicts a man that's just having a heyday. I mean, he's got everything at his disposal. Um, drink, and I don't think it's water. It's probably the best wine that there is or something like that. And maybe I don't want to just presuppose. But the picture is he has everything he wants to eat and drink. And he's comfortable He's enjoying life. And the Bible describes it, or describes it this way. He habitually dressed in purple. Um, sort of like Bernie here. He's dressed in purple. <laughs> the rich man of Kilsyth. <laughs> but every day he dresses in purple. He habitually dressed in purple in fine linen. See how the Bible describes it or Jesus describes it? Gaily living in splendor every day. Yeah, it was wonderful. He's just enjoying his life. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's how he lived his life and the attitude he had that Jesus kind of zeroes in on. Then there was a certain poor man. And for some reason, uh, Jesus lets us know that his name is Lazarus. We don't know the name of the rich man. Because the focus on the rich man is more not about his name, but about what he 
had and what he did and how he responded to all the things that he had in life. Uh, but the Bible describes Lazarus this way. You know, there's, this is the gate, sorry. This is the gate, I believe, to uh, the entrance of the rich man. And so he's outside of the gate and uh, just wanting anything to eat. And he had, the Bible said, uh, sores on his body. Uh, he was covered, actually, with sores. And we don't get into the details of how those sores came about. But I do know that sometimes, maybe Deb can help us out later with uh, lack of nutrition sometimes can cause sores and things to affect your body. And it, I just find it interesting that uh, here he is outside the gate of his master covered with these sores. And he's just so hungry. They picture him pretty good as being very thin. But he wanted, he just longed to be fed with just the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. As you know, Faith and I, we used to have a dog called Molly, Chocolate Lab. And she used to love it when we would eat. Because she would be at our feet. <laughs> and she always seemed to pick the sloppy eater. Uh, but we never had to, very much anyways, had to clean up afterwards if anything fell on the floor. And they're just uh, hoping to to have those crumbs. Well, this isn't a dog that's hoping to have the crumbs. It's a man. And that's how poor he was. And uh, so Jesus very well paints this picture in your mind of his circumstance. Even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Uh, I know that's not a very good thought to think about prior to lunch, but... Um, there is something about dogs that I, I'm learning more and more about they can sense disease, they can sense affliction, you can hide cancer in different uh, places in a room and they can find it eight out of ten times. They'll sniff it and stop. When God made dogs, uh, they, they're just amazing, their sense of smell. And when they would lick a wound, they were trying to heal it, they were trying to take care of it. And it's, I think the point is that God is trying to bring out is that the dogs seem to have more compassion for this man's predicament, not only of hunger, but his physical health. And we're trying to, to offer something uh, of solace and, and, and at least let him know that they were attentive to him. But he's outside the gate of the rich man. And these little points, they're, they're a bunch of little ones, but they're very, very important. Because it really creates the picture that the Lord wants us to see. And then it's just, then both men died. Now the, the, the poor man died first. And, you know, I guess you could understand that. Uh, lacking nutrition. Uh, sores that would get infected. Uh, and on and on it would go. Uh, so they both died. Uh, poor man first, but the rich man still still living, and then he dies. And, um, but it's kind of interesting how the text, you know, Jesus describes the deaths, uh, you know, the aftermath of the deaths. Um, the poor man died first, and he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. I've always enjoyed that little scripture. You know, when you think of someone that you love that's passed away, and they've um, not perfect, but they're they're a Christian and they've strived to to be like the Lord, and now they've passed away. One of the biggest comforts is to, is to just picture the angels taking them away. You know, I felt that way when I saw my mother die. You know, I, once she breathed her last, I just looked up. Because if that's true, then you're faithful, and I don't see the angels, but they take her. You know, and it's just such a comfort for such an awful situation where you're trying to grasp this departure and it's, it's, it's challenging. But there's no mention of any human being <clears throat> surrounding Lazarus when he died. He just, he died. <laughs> and then there's this tremendous comfort that immediately once he's dead that he's carried away by the messengers of God. And Hebrews 1.14 talks about are not angels ministering spirits to those who inherit salvation. And I think that's tagged into this. They're, they're, they serve in whatever way they, they serve. And, and I can't say, oh, you're an angel. Glad you're with us this morning. You just don't know. You know, we're talked about entertaining strangers unaware. 
you know, in the book of Hebrews, being an angel. It's always been a fascinating thing to me to comprehend all of that. And we had a good study, I believe, on angels and that we're not the only beings under God, but the angelic beings are also serving His will. But it's a pretty nice picture, eh? It helps us face death better. The rich man also died and was buried. Do you notice the difference? <laughs> the poor man had a tough all his life and he dies and he's carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And Abraham, Father Abraham they would call him, was the father of the faithful. Remember the promise that God gave to Abraham that through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Nations is plural. He's not just referring to Jews. And all those who exhibit the faith of Abraham will be children of Abraham. And so it's kind of light, uh, uh, appropriate that Jesus has this picture that Lazarus, even though he was poor and not very healthy, he was a child of Abraham and the angels were taking him to him because of his faith. He was faithful. Even in difficult circumstances, I would say horrendous circumstances, he maintained his faith in God. And as soon as he breathed his last, the angels were there to take him. And it says the angels, plural. You know, so all, it would be quite a spiritual eye-opener to be out of the afflictions of this life and then to be carried away. And that's the picture that Jesus wants us to, to get. But with the rich man who had everything in his life, he died and they buried him. That's what you do with people who are dead. You bury him. There's nothing said. You notice that? Did he die with a full stomach? Full bladder? I'm not trying to be gross. I'm just... He's a rich man. Everything he wanted at his disposal any time. The picture was every day. Did they bury him in his purple? What, would, what difference would it make? He was buried. Okay, so after death. Here we go. The rich man lifted up his eyes in Hades and was in torment. We had a pretty good study a long time ago on Hades, the Hedean realm. And uh, it's basically divided in two sections. I think sometimes when you see the word Hades, you associate it with hell because they both start with H. It's just kind of an automatic connection. But Hades is, is, is the place where the dead go. And there's two sections. The place of torment, which is where the rich man went, and the other side, which is paradise. And it's the, the place of waiting for the Lord to come back. And so the rich man lifted up his eyes in Hades and was in torment. He saw Abraham far away or far off, your version may say, and he also saw Lazarus in his bosom. Isn't interesting? Now he sees Lazarus. Whereas before, Lazarus was outside the gate. Of course, to get into the rich man's house, he had to go through the gate, which implies he had to go by Lazarus and didn't notice him. But now he sees him. But he sees him with Abraham. Now, again, you know, you're struggling with, uh, is everything about this true or not? But we'll find out that this rich man knew of Abraham. Because we find out he calls out to him and by name. You know, so uh, it, it is rather interesting. He asked Abraham that Lazarus may come and dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off his tongue. It's interesting, when Jesus was on the cross and suffering, he, he said, I thirst. And there's something about when water hits the tongue, the rest of the body just... I don't know, maybe I'm seeing something that's wrong here, but it, it, uh, it affects the rest of the body. Same when you go to eat something, and as soon as you put it in your mouth, mm, even though you haven't swallowed it, the whole body responds to it. But he asked that Lazarus may come and dip the tip of his finger in water and just cool off his tongue. Now this place of, uh, of torment in hell, or Hades, and then of course later on hell, is always something that's raised a lot of discussion with people. People say, well, how can a loving God 
put people in a situation like that. Truth of the matter is, he didn't. They did. They decided that that's where they're going to go. You have to you have to believe that. Everything in our life is is a result of making choices, and God does not puppet us. Nope, you can't do that. That would be sin. He gives us free choice, and we either choose what is right or choose what is wrong. And and we bear the consequences of it. And God does not enjoy seeing those who He has created in His image go to hell or to Hades. And it's interesting that God is using His own Son to tell us this story. And that His own Son is the one that would die on the cross, a horrendous death, so that people like the rich man would not have to go to this place of torment. So it's not like God is unjust. It's just that people have made their choices. Um, so we need to remember that. But there's this picture. And, you know, how do you describe this place? I mean, but God, or Jesus, has given us a picture in the Scriptures. And I don't want to take away from what, exactly what the Scriptures are saying. I mean, it talks about a bush that burned and didn't wasn't consumed with Moses. I mean, God can do what he says he's going to do. And Moses was marveled, marveled at this place and he couldn't understand it. But it was not consumed. And had God, not God taken it away, it would probably still be there burning today. So there's things about God that, uh, you know, just because we can't understand how he works all the time and how he can do all these things doesn't mean he can't do them. We need to remember that. But all of a sudden, what we're seeing here with the rich man that is after his death, it is a wake-up call. He is now aware of things. He's now aware especially that he made wrong choices and was reaping the consequences of them. Abraham and the rich man have a chat in Hades. And it's kind of interesting that the Lord brings this out. Notice what Abraham said to the rich man. Remember what you had in life? He received your good things. Now, is it wrong to receive good things in life? Is that what he's saying? No. You know, when he's asking, you know, remember what you had or saying, remember what you had in life, he's wanting the rich man to sit back and realize that everything he had in life was centered around him. There's a man outside the gate could use the scraps from the table. You probably throw them out. Remember? Abraham would not have said, remember what you had, unless it was possible for the rich man to remember. You received your good things. Then he says, remember what Lazarus had in his life? Bad things. Obviously, he wouldn't have said that concerning Lazarus unless the rich man knew that he was in need and had willfully ignored his needs. The word remember is really, really important in the scriptures. One of the greatest downfalls with the Israelites, so that only Joshua and Caleb entered the promised land of the original, was that they they would forget. They would forget to obey and do the things that God wanted them to do. They would forget to teach the things of God to their children from generation to generation. And so we're always re- reminded to take the time to remember. And that's why the first day of the week, as Jesus commanded, do this in remembrance of me around the table. And it's interesting that when you sincerely remember the Lord, it can help you with the sin that you've dealt with that week and give you the motivation to to be better the next week and also be an encouragement to others. So Abraham said now to the rich man, now Lazarus is being comforted. Now he is being comforted, implying he wasn't as long as he was outside your gate. But he's being comforted because he's here with me. I am, as God said, the father of the faithful. He was faithful. Now, you, there's a switch here. (laughs) You are in agony. You know, there's no dogs here to lick your wounds. Besides, he says, between us, this is always a marvel to me, Between us and you, there's this great chasm or chasm fixed in order that no one may cross over, either from us to you or you to us. 
I don't know if he's saying that the people like Lazarus are their mind is being tormented because of the, the suffering of those they know they can see afar off. I'm just thinking what he's saying is there's no way uh, that once you die, there's no way things can change. He is in comfort. You are in agony. You both made choices. And once you die, you can't change those choices. You can't send money to the church to help somebody's sins be forgiven. Money is a materialistic thing of no value before God. The blood of His Son is the most valuable commodity in this world. And only His blood can cleanse the sins of people. And I love that word, besides. There's this great chasm fixed. And so, the rich man realizes his situation, eh? So, he knows he can't get out of that situation. So, what do you think? You think about your family. So, we don't realize this in the beginning, but he had five brothers. And so, when he lived his rich life, gaily every day in splendor, he spent a lot of it with his brothers. And had a good time. And there's nothing wrong with that, but not to the neglect of others. Five brothers, the Bible designates. And you get close. I mean, your family, right? You get close to your family. So his first uh, evaluation of his situation is, oh, I'm not going to get out of here. I, and my brothers are no different than me. They're going to come here too. So you think, you know, what can I do to make sure my brothers don't come here? And this is, this is the, I'm, I'm, there's a climax in this lesson in the, in, that Jesus is giving. It's very, very important. He begged Abraham to send Lazarus back to his father's house. Lazarus is dead. And all of a sudden, Lazarus is there at the gate. <laughs> By the way, yes, I died. And so did your brother. He sent me back to you. He doesn't want you to be where he is. Will you, will you listen to me? You know, I mean, I don't know if, I mean, if I saw somebody resurrected from the dead, it certainly would get my attention. But the point Jesus brings out, is that enough to convince somebody to change? He wanted him to warn his five brothers and warn them lest they also come to this place of torment. That's the question. So, interesting answer. The best warning is not from a sign but from the Word of God. The Word of God that you got in front of you, there's nothing in this world more valuable than that. Nothing. You know, I keep seeing how many billionaires there are. I saw something yesterday on the computer that says, the richest woman in the world. You know, and they're billionaires. And they're smiling. Again, it's not wrong to have a billion dollars as long as it doesn't have you, right? But, is that what it's all about? I mean, is that what real value should be focused on? Is money? Well, the rich man is asking for a sign. And that will convince his brothers. No, no. See, they had Moses, they had the prophets. Now, they didn't have the New Testament or the New Testament. But at the time of this writing, they had Moses and the prophets. And those prophets would go out and proclaim the word of God. The Bible, Jesus himself in the Bible talks about that they mistreated the prophets and they stoned some of them and killed some of them. And what they actually did is they said to God, I don't want your word. You know, you can get to a point in life where uh, you feel very comfortable. You've worked very hard and you are where you are because of you. (laughs) And yet, God is not in the picture. And our life can change real quick. Had an impact. (laughs) Just a little uh, diversion there from my car accident. You know, that's what you think. It could have been over just like that. So notice what he says. If the brothers of the rich man would not heed the words of Moses and the prophets, then they would not be persuaded to repent by Lazarus or anybody else rising from the dead. The word of God you have in your lap that's now complete wasn't the time of Jesus. 
is more convincing than a miracle? People talk about, you know, if you're the church, then miracles occurred. Well, that's that happened in the early church, but they didn't have the New Testament. It convinced people that the ones who did the miracle had to be from God. So let's sit down and listen to what they have to say. That's what it's all about. But once the New Testament came in fully, as we have it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and so forth, because of the value of the Word of God being more important and valuable than a miracle, miracles ceased. And there's a lot of discrepancy about that. We're praying for a miracle. Why don't you just pray? <coughs> the answer to a prayer, in a lot of ways, is more powerful than a miracle when it was properly used. All those things were to convince people that the ones who did that were from God and that they should listen to the message that they had to say. Okay. So why do people prefer a sign from God rather than just believe in His Word? Well, they read the Bible, they had miracles, so it was with the early church, so that must be the church that they had miracles. They own miracles, we're not interested. But they need to understand why the miracles, as I just mentioned, were brought in. They led people to the truth through the ones who performed them. That's Mark 16, 14 to 16 in there. In an article written by Joe Slater, one of my favorite authors in the church, it's entitled, Give Me a Sign. I hope you'll bear with me. Our time's going. I always think I'm going to have a short lesson. I don't know what happens. I just open my mouth and here we are. <laughs> Give me a sign. God has never required trusting obedience without evidence. Biblical faith is not blind faith. Throughout the ages, he has shown himself to be infinitely worthy of our confidence. In ancient times, he used signs or miracles to confirm his word. That's Mark 16, 14 to 16. Jesus utilized abundant signs during his ministry. And despite such clear proof, his enemies taunted, Matthew 12, 38, we want to see a sign from you. You know, then we'll believe. But Jesus, knowing their corrupt hearts, rejected their ploy. He would give them no sign except, of course, his resurrection. God has blessed us today with his completely revealed, confirmed, and recorded word. His inspired apostles worked innumerable signs to verify it. That task being complete, no further proof is needed. Supernatural gifts, as they were, a blessing from God back then, right? Therefore, have, have ceased, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, 8 to 10. They had their purpose and had their place in the early church. But now the word of God, which is, by the way, the power of God, Romans 1, 16, the gospel is the power of God, is now in existence. Nevertheless, many, even today, clamor for a sign. A difficult decision confronts us. Give me a sign, Lord. We want to know what the future holds. Lord, send me a sign. More often than not, modern sign seekers assume their subjective feelings are signs from God. That's a very important point. This decision gives me peace. So, it must be God's will. Such reckoning is backward. He goes on to explain, we ought to be at peace because we know our decision is according to God's written will. Not just assume it is God's will because we feel at peace. It's important. And I can give you copies of this if you want. It all goes back to our subject for our lesson today. Facts, faith, and feelings. God's word establishes the facts, right? Upon God's word we have our faith or we base our faith. Knowing that we have trusted and obeyed God's word should make us, therefore, feel good. However, many have reversed this order. Here's what they, th they say. I feel like this is right. Therefore, that's what I believe. Therefore, it must be God's will. I found that interesting. We have God's confirmed will. We need no signs. We need no signs. I just found it interesting because it kind of deals with what's going on here. Send Lazarus back. That'll be a sign that they need to, to make changes in their life. No, they have Moses and the prophet. They have the word of God, Jesus says. The word of God is what they need from Moses and the prophets, not Lazarus coming back from the dead.
So why desire a sign over the Word of God? Just some thoughts. To know what God expects of us requires an effort on our part. We have to stop what we're doing. We have to take the time. We have to open the Bible. And we have to begin to study. We live in a society that's centered around me. It's a me-me society. What I want. It's very hard to get people to say, no, it's not about what you want. It's about what you need. And you need to take the time to stop what you're doing and open God's Word. One has to study, one has to research, one has to take the time, etc. We shouldn't have any problems understanding this because when you go to university for a degree, you have a perfect comprehension of what this is. You know that when you go there, you're going to have to really study if you want to get a degree. No problem with that. But when it comes to church, to understanding God's will, that's another thing for many people. People want a quick answer to everything. Everything they question in the Bible. If they value God's word as treasure, that goes back, I believe, to Proverbs chapter 2, you're never going to discover treasure unless you seek for her. Now, in that context, it's about wisdom. If you want wisdom, you have to seek for her as if she was hidden treasure. She's there, she's out there, but you have to make an effort, an effort to get it, to receive it. It's not a 30-second drive through It's not the church's fault if you don't get wisdom when you come. I didn't like the sermon. You never study any other time. You just expect the preacher, the teacher to do it all for you. It's not never going to work that way. You have to have a value for God's Word. And if we have that, like it's treasure, then they would be willing to search for her no matter how long or hard it took just to find her. We used to have a thing with our kids where we had have treasure hunts. Oh, man, they loved it. And the best part, eh, Faith, was to, to make up the clues. And we used to have it outside, you know. And the older kids were a little smarter than the younger kids, and they'd say, I know where it was. And Curtis, with his long legs, my son would take off. The other kids didn't know what it meant, but they just knew Curtis did. And so they were after Curtis, <laughs> just so he wouldn't get to the treasure first. <laughs> but you saw the desire the excitement, the anticipation of discovering something. They think of a sign from God as being more authentic and valid than his actual words. Yet according to John 12, 12, 48, we're going to be judged by the words of Jesus on the last day. The book will be open. Signs aren't going to be brought forward. The books are going to be open. The book... Whatever Jesus said will be discussed. What he's even saying today in this peril will be discussed. Okay. Facts, faith, and feelings. We've got to close this out. According to Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing. Hearing the words of Jesus. I want to have faith. I know the faith of others can stimulate whatever faith we have. But the real source of it, can I say the nutrition of it, comes from digesting the word of God. It doesn't come from what we feel is right, but from what we know is right. From what God has defined as being right, not me. You know, a lot of things feel right, but in the end you say, that was kind of a foolish decision. I shouldn't have gone with my gut feeling, but sometimes that's that little phrase, go with your gut feeling. What if your gut feeling's wrong? (coughs) Go with the flow. You don't wish for that. When you're going to Niagara Falls, you know, you need to know that where you're going is right because God has defined it as being right. And then whatever, when, whenever we do what God teaches us as being right, then and only then can we feel good and be pleasing in His sight. I, I have a real difficult time sometimes trusting my feelings. I'm just not sure. But with God and Bernie's lesson, you know, that confidence comes because of the word of God. It's just, do I have enough faith to to live my life and make my stand on what God says? Or do I want to take the wheel of my life and steer it? Or do I let go and let God take it? Those are big decisions. That's why there are too many religions that profess they are pleasing to God on the sole basis of how they feel. It makes me feel spiritual. A human being can make themselves feel spiritual without God? How does that work? 
you know, and they go through all these outward emotions. And I'm not trying to be critical, but I'm just saying that's how it works when things are based on feelings first. There's nothing wrong to have feelings as a Christian, but it's more a result of what you know to be true because God has told you it's true. You can feel good about that. And you can live your life according to those truths. So the rich man had it all wrong when he came to what produces faith in people. Hebrews 4.12, this is so important. That word of God on your lap, it's alive. I don't see it breathing. Why does the Hebrew writer talk like this? And I, I, I've wrestled with this passage, trying to understand it. I, I know the gist of it. But it's so descriptive. And I went through a lot of versions looking at it. The Word of God is living. It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Almost seems to imply it never gets dull. And it pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit. Well, where's the dividing line there? I don't know. Of both joints and marrow. It's down right in there. And it's actually able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Go figure. How does that work? Maybe that's things we can discuss in class. What does that mean? And I'm not sure about this translation, but there's some, some things about it I want to bring out. The Message Bible, translate it this way. Now, we have to be careful with different translations, but God means what He says. What He says goes. We're talking about the Word of God. His powerful Word is sharp as a surgeon's scalpel, cutting through everything, whether it's doubt in your life or defense or whatever. Wherever you are in life, it'll cut through laying us open to listen and to obey what instructs us. Uh, we can discuss that at, you know, later on. I don't want to take away from what God's saying in His Word, but sometimes I just find Hebrews 4.12 a little hard to pinpoint exactly what that's talking about, other than just the Word of God is just not a book. It exposes you for who you are, truly are, lays you right open, and then invites you to come and follow what it says uh, so you can come to a, a real good relationship with God. So is the rich man the only one that has it all wrong? John twenty twenty five, like the rich man, Thomas had it all wrong as well when he said, unless I shall see, the sign, you know, like a sign, unless I shall see in his hands the imprint of his nails, uh, the nails and put my finger up into the place uh, of the nails and put my hand up into his side where that spear went, I will not believe. Show me a sign and I'll believe. But I won't believe otherwise. So many people today are like much like Thomas in that they refuse to believe the words that Jesus has given us simply because they have not seen the resurrected Lord. Your whole life, when you think about it as a Christian, is based on that book, the Bible, and what it says. Abraham, the father of the faithful, makes it quite clear that unless our faith is solely based upon the word of God then no miracle will be able to sustain that faith for any length of time. Miracle's exciting, but it became a, a miracle show time. You know, people were following Jesus just to see a miracle. They weren't interested in what he had to say. They weren't interested that he was the Son of God. But the Word of God sustains us each day of our lives. That's why it's so much more powerful. So in conclusion, every human being from the beginning of time to the end of time needs this faith of Abraham Romans 4 is one of my favorite passages 20 to 22 yet with respect to the promise of God Abraham did not waver in unbelief but he actually grew strong in faith giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised you know God said it I believe it let's move on (laughs) that was Abraham he was able also to perform and God had promised that through his seed all the nations of the earth were blessed. I believe he waited for this promise to be fulfilled for 25 years. And in that time he did not waver once in unbelief. Therefore also, because of that faith of his, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. He is indeed the father of the faithful. He is even willing to offer up his own son just because God told him to. Just like God offered his own son for us. That's why he's put in that pinnacle of having the kind of faith that all people need to have without faith it is impossible to please the Lord God faith comes from hearing not seeing, not feeling but by the word of Jesus if we profess to be faithful children of Abraham then we need to be in that word of God
We need to be in it. And we need to be happy to be in it. And we need to let other people know how it makes us happy and invite them to join you in the study of God's Word. I hope this lesson, I kind of rushed real quick here, has helped us and stimulated us to, to realize the power of God's Word. We say, oh, this person won't respond to it. We've judged them already. We judge the Word of God as being insufficient. Since it's living and active and able to do all these things, you give the Word of God to somebody and leave it with them. And God, who is the wonder of all creation, I mean, He wasn't created, but I mean, He, he has all power, is able to take that Word and get right in that heart of that person and lay them bare and then make a change. Isn't that wonderful to have that Word? The awesome power of the Word of God. Let's now stand and sing the hymn that's been selected, 852. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, then time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the Savior shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share when his chosen ones shall gather to the home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when the roll setting sun. Let us talk of all his wonders, love, and care. Then when all of life is over and the work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll Thank you, Brian, for that lesson this morning. I'm going to close this out in a word of prayer, and then we will have some announcements, and then um, the kids will come up and they'll have some um, Sunday school singing. So if you bow with me, we'll close in a word of prayer. Dear loving Father, once again, joy has filled our hearts. For once again, you have given us this opportunity to come here. We've heard your word, and we're just truly thankful for that, dear Lord. Also, dear Lord, at this time, we just ask that you continue to be with us. As we leave this place, dear Lord, and as we meet others, we just pray that everything that we say and everything that we do will bring glory and honor to your name. Dear Lord, we just ask that you keep us safe so that we can we can return again at the next appointed time. And once again, dear Lord, a prayer from our hearts to yours. And we pray it all through your loving Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So coming up on March 11th at 8 a.m. at the Dragonfly is the men's breakfast. And on the 19th is the breakfast club drop-off. And it's also at 1.30 will be the elders, speakers, and preachers meeting. And on the 20th is uh, ladies Bible study here at the building. And on the 21st is, oh, young at heart. You're getting an old funny movie at the Heart Tongues. So there you go. <laughs> and um, that's pretty much it for the, the dates. Kathy asked me if I could read this to the uh, congregation, and it says, um, Thank you so much for all of the lovely cards and thoughts and the prayers and gifts, both for my birthday and for the passing of my aunt. 
um, I was feeling low, and you will, you all lifted me up so much. All of, to all of my family, truly appreciate you. In Christian love, Kathy Padfield. So, this is soon going to become a secret language curse of writing. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that uh, that's it for me? Does anybody else have any other announcements? Just Brian, time, change your clocks next Saturday night. So. Time change. Lose an hour sleep, but no extra hour after supper. Okay, we're ready for the singing. I think Andy's going to lead that for us. All right. Yeah. All right. Yes. <laughs> we got a good little group of kids today. Hello, Karen. How you doing?